John Garcia, welcome back to T-Town. I hope you're having a great afternoon. I am, Ryan. Uh, a little more calm today as opposed to yesterday, but uh, eventful nonetheless. Have you taken a you know a couple of minutes to breathe and to, to breathe in the <laughs> oxygen and get sort of refueled and rekindled a little bit? Oh, it's, it's good, man. I had a real big, nice breakfast today, kind of took it easy, hitting the road now a little bit. And, well, we still got a lot to, to look back on, but, but obviously it's, uh, it's a little more normal uh, compared to what it was the last week or so. But um, like you said, you think you, you know what's going to happen, and then, you know, the day comes and, and we get surprised a little bit. But, John, as I was talking yesterday, e- even you guys, I would not, and I've told you this a million times, and even more so today than it was even a couple of years, three or four years ago when I told you this, uh, I would not want to – to, to do the work that you guys do because a lot of these recruits will tell you anything. They'll, they'll, they'll say, hey, yes, I'm going to Alabama. Oh, I, yeah, I'm going to Clemson. Yeah, I'm going to Texas A&M. I'm going to Tennessee. Uh, I mean, a, a prime example is what I used yesterday. We're talking about a mother who went up on the stage and did not even know where her son was going. That gives us a little insight into difficulties that you guys do as recruiting analysts. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of examples of that. Um, and, and even with the schools they're picking, I remember when Xavier McKinney um, picked Alabama at the Under Armour game, I was assigned all the Alabama angles at the game, and he, he was a decommitment from Alabama. Um, there were reports of him kind of talking trash about Alabama. Clemson was the favorite. Ohio State came in. Georgia was in there. So when he was time to announce, I was on the other side of the field, and I was like, yeah, I probably don't need to even go over there. And then all of a sudden I said, you know what, let me just you know, see it all the way through. He picks Alabama, and I find out at a later date that the coaches on staff assigned to kind of keep, keep track of the game and keep track of where the kids were committing, they did the same thing I did. They weren't even paying attention at the time because he wasn't supposed to go there. So obviously he picked Alabama on television, and, and everyone was, was – very surprised and they took the commitment and he signed with Alabama the whole nine yards but um, there's just a lot of examples of of kids wanting to hide it from everyone and McKinney not only hid it from Alabama and all the other schools in contention but his own father who was standing next to him had no idea now the difference between McKinney's parent and Jacob Copeland's parent which is who you're referring to um, McKinney's dad wanted him to go to Alabama so he was surprised in a very positive way and was really excited uh, for Xavier, who I think is going to turn some heads this year at Alabama. Let me ask you, John, when you look at the instant impact guys, can you give me a couple of guys? And I know when you talk about a top 10 class, there's a lot of guys that will make instant impacts. But just from your perspective, with looking at Alabama's ability to play guys early and the willingness to play guys early like they've done this year, uh, do you give me a couple of guys that maybe you're looking at going, these guys can be instant impact players. You know, Ryan, you got to go to the secondary. Um, not only with the talent Alabama brought in, and I was actually going through it last night, maybe Saban's best DB group in one class. A lot of them had two or three really good players, and obviously it remains to be seen with these five. But talent-wise, rankings-wise, I mean, this is a ridiculously strong group. And normally – that would mean a guy or two would see the field as, as, as freshmen, as first-year players. But when you couple it with the fact that Alabama lost every single DB you saw on the field last year in a meaningful situation, not named Deontay Thompson or Trevon Diggs, um, it means those guys are going to be even more expected to contribute immediately. Savion Smith is there already. Uh, he's one that we've talked about um, from that early signing period. Josh Jobe, same deal. But you signed the number one corner in the country yesterday, Patrick Sertain Jr. Um, This is among the top two to three corners I've ever scouted in terms of his ability, in terms of how ready he is to perform at the collegiate level. 6'2", 185 pounds or so, so he'll fill out the frame. But he's a technician. And his father, who, of course, has the same name, NFL Pro Bowler, all that, I I grew up watching him in the NFL. He was a technician, but he was 5'10". Well, Pat is 6'2", 180, with maybe more athleticism than Dad and some of that same you know, experience uh, and, and ability in between the ears. So it's hard to, to say that, you know, all these guys will see the field, but Sevion Smith, 
and Patrick Sertain, I think, is where that conversation begins, and in large part due to their experience, uh, even though Patrick Sertain is, is just a high school senior. All right, uh, last time, last year about this time, we could go back to some of the text messages that I shared with John, and I said, man, how do you say this guy's name? And, and I mean, I was butchering <laughs> it, and you taught me how to say it, uh, Tua Tonga Valoa. Now you're going to have to teach me how to say another guy. I think I've got the last name, Anoma, Anoma. Okay, but the first name, Yabi, Yabi, Anoma, is that even he, close? Well, he, at the Under Armour Week, we, we called him a Yabi. And he never corrected us. Now it wasn't as big of a conversation point as Tango Vailoa, obviously. <laughs> but um, this kid is the number three player in America for us at twenty four seven sports. So um, if there's going to be a, a pass rusher to come in and make an impact, obviously it would be him. Um, this was a great year for DBs, edge rushers, and quarterbacks. And Alabama got the number one edge rusher and the number one cornerback. So a lot of people are, are kind of looking down at the class, relatively speaking compared to years past, and rightfully so to some degree. But at the positions of need, Alabama did what it needed to do. And, and Anoma, is, um, he's a freak. There's no other way to put it. Uh, only played football for two years, knows it, um, willing to work. Uh, the main reason he picked Alabama is because, you know, it was the scenario where he could compete and build and work and grow all together um, and be challenged along the way. Um, and that's one of the reasons he fell in love with Alabama. They were kind of a favorite for him for the last six months or so leading up to, to his signature. Um, and I think um, not only is he the headliner of, of the class in terms of ranking, but um, he's kind of an infectious kid. Um, he's a scrappy dude. Other kids like him. Um, Jordan Davis, another defensive end, pass rusher type that Alabama signed, told me all week at Under Armour Week he was watching a yacht. He was kind of checking him out, seeing what he did so well, because everybody knew that he was, you know, one of the highest rated kids at the game. So um, that kind of stuff, I think, you talk about an impact. Not only can a kid like that impact his own success and see the field and, and get his accolades on his own right, but he's, he's already got an impact with some of his classmates who will be competing for those same snaps. So I think uh, a very positive field there for Alabama. And again, another position of need. There's not a lot of uh, great pass rushers on this Alabama team this past year. In terms of pure athleticism and the traits you look for in today's game, I think they manufactured pass rushes at times, and there was a lot of guys cycling in to help do it. Now you got guys who can do it kind of on their own. If Alabama signs three additional players, maybe they get to that number, because that was the original number, 22, and then Nick Saban went it yeah. to 23. Uh, if Does the perception of this class – uh, if they were able to add three more names, I don't think we'd be sitting here uh, being a Debbie Down or going, oh, you know, because you look at uh, you, you look at his, you talked about Patrick Sertain, but how about Savion Smith? I mean, he was also the number one uh, junior college cornerback. Uh, so they've kind of locked up, as you said, talked about the defensive backs. Yeah, and, and, and normally, you know, we've seen Nick Saban do that. We, we've seen two five-stars in a class, you know, Tony Brown and Marlon Humphrey came in together. Um, Minka Fitzpatrick and Kendall Sheffield came in together. You know, so we've seen two at the top be incredibly strong. But what makes this class unique is that three, four, and five are all really, really good as well. Josh Job, a top 50 overall prospect. Jalen Armour Davis, number one prospect in the state of Alabama on 24-7 sports, a top 10 corner, a top 100 overall prospect. And then the last guy who, who will be mentioned last and maybe it won't, stay that way as, as they actually begin their careers. Eddie Smith is a guy who in the last year has grown a little bit. His stock has risen a lot of bit, and a lot of schools went all in for him. Um, so he's the lowest rated of the five, but um, he was a late riser. So he's kind of beginning to hit that ascent that you want to see kids, you know, find that next level at some point. So when the fifth guy in the group is one that a lot of schools kind of went all in for late in the game, uh, you feel really good about that. So I think that's the difference with this class. And they all can play corner legitimately, and some of them have safety traits as well, particularly Josh Job, I think Eddie Smith as well. So when that's the group um, and there's such a need there, it, it's really hard to look at the class negatively at all because that was the first thing Nick Saban talked about last year on signing day. He wanted corners. He didn't get any. And, and obviously this year he went out and got five, including you know two of the best uh, – in their, you know, uh, divisions in their, at their level. 
We are talking right now with John Garcia, 24-7 Sports. Let me ask you about the what went wrong for Alabama because we are discussing that. Uh, was it coaching turnovers? Was it just too many? Uh, was some of these guys maybe not elite recruiters? Nick Saban seems to be added uh, the, some of those guys back to the staff and seems to be gearing up uh, with another run. And I'm sure that competitive edge that he brings to the table uh, will probably go out and he'll sign a number one class next year. I'd, I'd probably put money on it. Uh, but let me ask you, what went wrong with with a standpoint of obviously not meeting the Alabama standard? Yeah, the early the early odds for next year, I, I think, lie with the two national championship game participants because um, those classes are going to be neck and neck. But either way, um, there's no doubt that it was it was a step down for Alabama. As to why, I think there's a lot of reasons. Uh, we mentioned the number. The number is always a part of it. I mean. If you look at the six classes ahead of Alabama's, there's only one class that took lower, fewer than 20 prospects that was ranked higher, and that was Clemson, which which had one of the top uh, average star rating or average rating per commitment uh, in the country. So, in terms of quality of the programs that took 20 or less, Alabama was number two in the country to Clemson. So, I think you got to look at it from a relative perspective in the rankings because it does favor and lean toward those schools that are able to sign 24, 25, or more prospects because it's going to weigh those, those, that quantity more so than the quality. So I think that's always a caveat that we have to throw out there. But there's no doubt that Alabama had some misses yesterday. Justin Ross, um, the consensus top, top player in the state, big-time wide receiver prospect, that was a big miss. Now, his favorite recruiter was Derek Ansley, so did his departure all but open the door wide open for Clemson? Or was it something more? Um, he said it was more about the the, posi- the position specific success Clemson has had at that wide receiver position, particularly with big, strong wide receivers like him. And again, it's one of those things that you kind of understand. I mean, they've had success with with guys who look just like Justin Ross, and in the end, that was part of it. Now, I think a secondary part of it that he won't talk about because he's he's a really good kid. There's no quarterback in this class for Alabama. Um, and the guy who was recruiting him at Clemson was the number one quarterback and number one player in America, Trevor Lawrence, who he grew very, very close to. So if things are close and your favorite coach from one school leaves and that school also doesn't have a quarterback that you've grown tight with and the other school that you're considering has all those things, you know, you can kind of see what happened there for, uh, for Alabama. So in that regard, yeah, I think – staff turnover and the numbers game slash inability to land a quarterback really hurt with some prospects, particularly with Justin Ross. I think with others, it was just a matter of priority and kids not knowing their place. I was told with, with Malik Langham's recruitment, the in, the other in-state kid Alabama lost, there was some like up and downness. He did not quite know where he stood, particularly these last few weeks, even though my sources in Tuscaloosa say he was at or near the top of, of the defensive line board. So there was a little bit of inconsistency with the message from Alabama. Now, is that is that on Nick Saban? Is that on Carl Dunbar? You know, what about Brian Dable, who was his recruiter at one point? Where, where does that factor in? I'm not quite sure. But uh, in the end, he told me he picked Florida because he thinks that the depth chart is a little easier to maneuver. So sometimes it's very tangible. And sometimes there's, there's not a lot you can do, even though you thought you were in the driver's seat. And, and Malik Langham had Alabama as his public leader for quite some time. And privately, Alabama was, was in that same place uh, for the last several weeks um, until he really dug into depth charts and things like that on Monday night. So sometimes it's very simple and sometimes it's not. But, uh, again, Alabama – won't have this happen again, and, and I think, like you said, Nick Saban's done a good job at, at making sure of that with the hires that he's made. John, give us a little quick preview and the final question here. What does 2019 look like from your perspective as you look in this state in, in the quality uh, and the quantity of this 2019 class that will be now uh, the goal of all you recruiting analysts dialed in on this upcoming class that will be uh, 364 days away? I'm really excited about this class, Ryan, um, because I love the state of Alabama. I love covering it. it. It is my primary passion and responsibility. And this group, 2019, at the top is as deep as I've seen. We've, we've seen classes where there were multiple five stars at the top, but then it kind of tallied off. When you got to four, five, six, seven, eight in the state, 
It just wasn't as strong. This one's going to go well beyond a dozen kids who are legitimate top 247 prospects, um, and I think a handful of them will be legitimate five-star candidates. So the state is certainly on the uptick compared to 2018. Quarterback and offensive line, those are the two strongest positions. Um, Bo Nix is already committed to Auburn at quarterback. Talia Tengovailoa, you might know his brother, is in the class. Paul Tyson as well. These are all four-star guys in the state. And there's a secondary group of quarterbacks that are beginning to emerge as well, including Justin Ross's quarterback, Peter Parrish at Central Phoenix City. And on the O-line, it's even stronger. Number one player in the state is Clay Webb. Alabama's got a great shot there. Pierce Quick is the best tackle in the state right now. He's already committed to Alabama. Amari Kite over at Thompson High School, a teammate of Talia Tengovailoa, representing the offensive line as well. So those positions are incredibly deep along with quarterback, but there's guys popping up every day, Ryan. My Division One list in the state is already at 75 prospects, and, and it's, only, it's only hit 102 times since I've done this job, and this one's going to hit 100 by the 4th of July, I would imagine. John, I said it was going to be the last question, but Pittsburgh Steelers just sent out a press release. They have hired Carl Dunbar as defensive line coach uh, there. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts. Wow. And and what do you know about the possibility of, of a guy like Bo Davis? Because I think you kind of follow the technicality side of this. And, you know, I know he's got that show cause, but uh, could, could Nick Saban possibly bring back a guy like Bo Davis? I think it's been discussed. Um, actually, I know it's been discussed. Okay. To what extent, I couldn't tell you. But um, when it comes to recruiting at that position, um, Bo Davis was, was one of the best Nick has ever had up front. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, and I don't think it's a knock on Carl Dunbar. I think he did a really good job, an, an underrated job, not only with recruiting but with his defensive line on the field. I thought Alabama's D-line was a big reason why it was able uh, to win the national championship this year and a couple of years ago as well. Um, but recruiting-wise, Carl Dunbar is just not the animal that Bo Davis is. Of course, all of these good recruiters, you gotta you got to play in the gray area a little bit. It just is what it is. He got caught up. Um, Nick Saban did what he had to do with it. But we've seen Nick bring guys back for various reasons, kind of let them lick their wounds and come back. So I wouldn't rule it out uh, at this point. Um, and I think there's some other strong candidates now that I'm trying to think about. I think Freddie Roach, who's over at Ole Miss, uh, he's a guy that, to keep an eye on. He's an excellent young recruiter from the state, obviously played at Alabama. So there's there's a lot of good names uh, that will be chomping at the bit to jump on uh, this Alabama staff. The timing, though, pretty interesting. I mean, you're going to have to uproot a guy, it looks like, if it's not uh, a Bo Davis because these guys just signed you know, their, their recruiting class and they're obviously trying to build a, a spring practice program, what have you, with their school. So – it's going to be a, uh, a tough situation, but at Alabama, you, you, you'll never have um, too long to wait uh, for kids, for, or excuse me, for adults to knock down the door at a position, uh, at, a, at a coveted position like the D-line coach. And that'll be a big recruiting priority for 2019 as well. So, um, again, recruiting will be a monster part of that evaluation for Nick.